the flying fat boy. It is said that fat people get that way primarily through a natural tendency to overeat. I would not venture an opinion, not being a doctor. However, as an aviator, I will say that fat pilots are so rare. In long experience in flying, I have known only one, and as my story about this fat fellow will reveal, it was something more than a gastric urge to stuff himself that put the lard on him. Not that my long experience in aviation is without limitation, for it has been chiefly in bush flying conditions of which are anything but conductive, conducive to the kind of living to make pilots fat. It may be possible to grow fat in airlines these days with electronics to do much of your flying for you, as well as a co-pilot, a navigator, a flight engineer, and particularly a pretty hostess to bring you something from the buffet whenever you feel inclined. Still, they do say that airlines' captains' stomach ulcers are proportionate to the size and complexity of their commands. And ulcer men are never fat men, are they? Speaking of modern aircraft in terms of complexity and size, which is to say of modern engines and equipment and what can be lifted in the matter of passengers or freight, is there much difference in the tensions a pilot suffers flying 50 passengers in a ship worth a million and that suffered by the like of him with only two or three in a crate worth what would not pay for the fuel consumption of its big sister for the same trip. I maintain that the difference is only in the, deg in the degree to which the pilot is inured to the stress of responsibility for his particular command. I have seen young fellows go into bush pilot work, flying the smallest and simplest of aircraft, and well enough trained for the job, so drastically stressed in the first months as to be scarcely recognizable in appearance and behavior both as the same men. More truly, I should say that I have never yet seen one such young fellow who did not take a considerable beating, even that fat boy, who was the only one not to become in the process poor as string, as they say. In fact, that fat boy even put on condition. Now, while worry will keep one thin, it cannot do so by itself. What I mean is that gastric processes are also involved. The worried person either does not eat enough because of preoccupation with worry, or by the same token does not benefit properly by what he eats. In the case of the bush pilot, there is the additional factor of not getting proper regular meals. The bush pilot mostly has to fly from first light to the last. This means he has to get up in the dark, in a hurry, with little or no appetite for food, even should appetizing food be available at such an hour. The people he serves, the bush people, are probably the most hospitable one could meet and would stuff him to death, but rarely does he get nearer to their settlements and homesteads than the airfield serving each, and he never has time to accept an invitation to their tables, running as he must to strict schedule 
responsible in movement not only to his employers, to whom his dalliance is money lost, but to air traffic control, ever ready to assume that he has lost himself and to embarrass him with their eager search and rescue, even when someone coming out to the airstrip to meet him is thoughtful enough to bring him a bite to eat. Most likely he hasn't time or appetite to eat it, up to his eyes as he is sure to be in the paperwork and all the rest concerned with passengers and freight and fueling and reporting to ATC. Usually he will be going till last light, and then by the time he has fixed his kite up for the night according to the rules, and has done all the rest of what is expected of him, such as delivering the personal packages and messages entrusted to him, talking to everyone who wants to know how things are, where he has been, and having the couple of drinks he has been denied all day by the rules and needs so badly now. Everyone else has eaten, and what has been kept for him, if anything at all, has lost its savor for one long gone beyond hunger and wanting only to lay his head down and sleep. The fact that the fat boy worried just as much as any other laddie new to the game, and yet during his apprenticeship, even put on weight, goes to prove what I have said about the necessary gastric element in the matter of losing condition through worry, because he kept his through sheer inexorable feeding of his face. He was a fair lump of a laddie, turning the scale at round 180 to start with, and bringing it pretty close to 200 by the time force of gravity reacting to the out rage he persisted in committing upon it as with a pig with wings, asserted itself in the drastic manner description of which constitutes the burden of this narrative. His bulk was a standing joke in the locality. However, it was actually a nuisance to his employers. They were a very small charter concern operating a couple of little kites, one that would carry no more than 500 pounds in freight or passengers, and one antiquated rag and wood freighter with a load limit of a thousand pounds. Passengers are taken to average 170 pounds weight each. The lighter the pilot, the less need for concern about overweight passengers or the putting on of that extra bit of freight. When the fat boy failed to lean down as expected, his employers put him to flying their old freighter, for there is less tied up in the overloading of an aircraft carrying only freight, and anything the fat boy flew with a full payload was for a certainty overloaded. This old crate, familiarly known as the region, of her operations, Cape York Peninsula and the Gulf Country of Queensland, as the Flying Fowl House was a dragon, a biplane with twin engines, really only an outsized tiger moth. Well, the fat boy had always been well fed, apparently, and immediately he showed concern over the restrictions on his feeding as a bush pilot. Most other initiatives begin by expressing some feeling in the matter, but soon drop it under the stress of their initiation. Not so the fat boy. He positively fretted over it, and must even have lost a bit of weight until he got things organized. He did the one thing possible to keep well fed in the circumstances, 
which was to see to it that a supply of food was always ready for him to grab at a moment's notice and to do his feeding while he flew. He did it very thoroughly. Away from base he had contacts at all the townships, cattle stations, and mining camps on his various runs, whom he would inform in advance of his gastronomic requirements as seriously as he informed the regular agents of needs in the matter of fuel, calling them by telephone or radio or by doing a turnover them before coming into land. He would no more take off without a package of food stowed within reach in the cockpit than he would with empty tanks. Something might have been said in praise of the determination he showed in the matter, only for the obvious compulsion behind it, for all his plumpness compared with the gauntness of other young pilots in the circumstances. His eyes were even more haggard and tending more to the nervous blinking than most, his manner more absent, his speech more hesitant, and just like the rest of him of them, after a couple of beers, he would lay down his head and fall asleep. These apprentices to bush flying inevitably meet, sooner or later, some critical situation in their flying that either makes or breaks them as pilots, as bush pilots, anyway. What troubles them so much at first is awareness of the inevitability of such a situation and lack of confidence in their ability to deal with it when it does arise. Having dealt with it satisfactorily, they never look back. You see the change in them immediately, in eyes, in manner, in filling out of the usual gauntness, in drinking capacity. As for those who fail the test and live, they simply fade away. The fat boy took his testing in the incident I am about to relate, the details of which I had from him personally. To do it full justice, I will set it out in his own words, which by reason of their vividness I remember pretty well. However, since force was lent to the effect of the narrative on me by the fact that I knew the scene, I feel it proper to describe the same for those who do not know it. Even those who may know something of the scene through flying up and down the backbone of Cape York Peninsula between Thursday Island and Cairns during the tourist season, the season of the dry southeasterly weather, as many do, would not realize what that harsh brown wilderness of stunted trees and cracked, cracked clay pans and empty rivers and vast distances vanishing into smoke haze can be like in the wet monsoon, which was how it was when this incident took place. Then the dusty ochres of the landscape are replaced by green, emerald, and jade of plunging gully and sweeping plain, malachite of swamp land, barrel and bice of burgeoning tree, all laced with the sparkling silver of that which has wrought the miracle, water, and with great thunderheads crowding the erstwhile empty skies and the weary distances drawn in behind purple rain curtains. Settlement of the particular region is practically nil, such as there is being nearer the coast of the Coral Sea 
on the east, the Gulf of Carpentaria on the west, the fat boy was flying the old foul house. He had come right to the tip of the peninsula to deliver a load of stores to the base camp of a mining survey team holed up beside an all-weather airstrip for the wet season. He had flown north from Cohen that morning, a distance of a couple of hundred miles, three hours flight in that old box of tricks, and he aimed to get back as soon as possible because Met Service forecast a spell of weather for the top end of the peninsula that would keep him grounded for days if caught there. As usual, he had ordered his rations in advance. These were brought out to the strip by the camp cook himself, who sought the return favor of personal delivery and collection in cairns of a package of dry cleaning he also brought along. The rations consisted of a thick <clears throat> stack of sandwiches of the meat of mangrove crab which is a favorite of anybody who has tasted it, and particularly of the fat boy, as the cook knew. Apart from the small mail bag and two or three packages that were stowed in the mail locker down at the rear end of the long empty cabin, there were no seats except a small jump seat behind the cockpit. He was traveling back light. That would make for easier flying, because the old box was so tail-heavy that with any sort of load she never could be trimmed nose down, sufficiently to save the pilot from having to lean on the stick all the way. For those who don't know the dragon, let me explain that the cockpit is a tiny wedge-shaped affair stuck right in the nose, shut off from the cabin by a bulkhead so close that the pilot can bump the back of his head against it. Access to the cockpit is by a narrow doorway on the starboard side. The fat boy stowed his rations on the floor of the cockpit between the bulkhead and his seat so that he could get at them merely by reaching down with his right hand while yet there was no chance of the packages being able to slide about and tangle with controls through the rough going that was certain in this weather. He was at the mining camp airstrip little more than an hour, busy all the while with unloading, refueling, making arrangements by radio for his return flight. His business on the ground completed, he climbed aboard for the lonely flight back to Cohen, got one of the men he left behind to wind up his props and start him. Then he taxied away, took off, headed southward, sitting there while the dragon dragged her way up the sky with all the wearying slowness of her kind, and while he studied with eyes whose blinking betrayed something of the anxiety he felt about it, the lurking menace in the Qunim masses rearing to ten thousand feet and more abeam his course that much, I assume, about his thoughts and feelings, because they are those of any airman in the circumstances. The rest I will tell in his own words. I climbed to four thousand, leveled out, trimmed her, then I felt hungry, like I always used to as soon as I settled down for a flight. I reached down for the scrano, broke the string on the package, and tried to hook out one of those 
crab sandwiches. All I could feel was cloth. I dragged the package out and saw it only had in it a pair of pants and a wind jacket. I ought to have known before. The tucker was done up in newspaper, just like the dry cleaning the cook gave me, but there was a ticket on the dry cleaning. I'd gone and stowed my grub in the back locker. Well, you wouldn't believe the shock it gave me to find. I had nothing to eat. It was like a kind of blow, like bad news or something. It made me feel numb, even like I could have cried with disappointment. I never thought of going back to get the sandwiches. I couldn't go walking around in that old crate and let her fly herself. For a start, she was right wing low as well as tail heavy to hell. I'd tried flying her hands off. I knew what she was like with anyone moving about in the back too. I just sat there staring out ahead with that numb feeling. Then suddenly I felt a pang inside me in the guts. It was like my guts were expanding and contracting. It was a terrible feeling and my guts started rumbling, something awful. It was so bad I felt weak. I felt I must put food in my stomach or I'd faint. I could smell the crab sandwiches, even taste them, and it made my throat go up and down and I thought I was going to be sick, that I'd have a blackout and prang unless I had something to settle my stomach. I thought of heading for a station and putting down, but all the dirt strips were out through the rain. I knew. I thought of turning back and saying I was having trouble with a donk, but that would only start something back at base. Besides, I'd got too far away and would lose too much time and probably get caught by the weather but all the way to Cohen, just sitting there looking down at that poisonous green and that water everywhere and those q -nims closing in and listening to those donks and waiting for one to run out of noise on me. I knew I just couldn't stand it unless I had something to eat, unless I had one of those crab sandwiches. Then it struck me that I was taking more risk flying feeling like I did than having to go to get the sandwiches, so I decided to give it a burl. I trimmed her nose heavy as far as the rim would go, then slipped my belt and got up and stood there to see what she would do. She put her nose down and dropped her starboard wing. Then she yawed slightly to starboard and started to gently spiral down. I reckoned she'd be okay at that, so I straightened her up again, then let her go and ducked out into the cabin. I no sooner got past the center of gravity when the nose came up. I stopped and waited. She was going into a gentle climbing turn, but the turbulence chucked her up and she started climbing steeply. I got scared she might stall if she got any more tail heavy, so I went back to the cockpit. That pang in my guts had stopped after I'd got out of the seat. It started again the moment I sat down again. Now it was worse than ever. I stood up to try and stop it. It wouldn't work. I cursed myself for not having made a dash for the back locker while I had the chance before. Then I thought that if I throttled back the engines a bit with a few more revs in the starboard donk to keep the wing up, she'd be nose heavier and she wouldn't yaw. I knew I'd have to get the grub. 
there was nothing else for it, so I pulled 250 revs off the starboard engine and 300 off the port. Then I had another go at getting down the back. Well, I only got about halfway down when she hit a bump that threw me off balance and I slipped on the oily floor and went sliding on my back right down to the bulkhead. My weight down there immediately pulled her nose up, of course, but I didn't notice her attitude then. I was only thinking of the tucker. The first thing I did when I got on my feet was to grab the package out of the locker. I saw how things were when I turned round. She was climbing at an angle of about 45 and clawing like mad. I could hear the revs dropping off. I thought of her stalling and sliding back to tear off ailerons and rudder. I tried to run up the hill to the cockpit, only got a step or two, then went flat on my pus and slipped back again to the bulk head. My weight then pulled her tail down till she stood on it. I didn't know what she did then because I was too frightened and confused and chucked about. I found myself lying against a back window looking through the perspex at the green ground and the clouds and the bits of blue sky all wheeling around. Then I was in the roof lying on the slats protecting the fabric. Then I rolled down past the windows again <clears throat> and landed on the floor. I tried to get up but fell on my face. Now she was diving with the donks howling. Just as I got up again she pulled out of the dive and bunged on the G's so hard I couldn't move. Then she started clawing up again. I never had a hope of getting up that slippery slope with the turbulence. I slid right back again. I sort of gave up then, and as I lay against the bulkhead, I saw what she did at the top of the climb. As the starboard wing went down, she did a wing over. As she rolled, I landed on the roof again. This time, one of my shoes slipped between the slats and bashed through the fabric. When she rolled out, I hung there by my foot upside down. I thought my foot was being torn off. I remember while I hung there being able to see ahead through the cockpit windshield while she dived. The ground was still a good way off. I think it was the force of her pulling out of the dive that pulled my foot out of the shoe. I fell smack on the floor. It was a vicious dive that time. She came up out of it almost vertically. I went down the back in a heap again. I didn't observe what happened then. I was being chucked all over the place. I didn't know anything much till I found myself on the floor up near the cockpit with her going down, spiraling. I soon found when I got up, I fell into the cockpit, into the seat. Then it dawned on me that she was spinning to the right. I suppose it did more by instinct because everything was blurred. But I gave her full opposite rudder. It wasn't hard because I was standing on the rudders. She took a long time to stop. I think I must have had her nose down before she did stop. I'm not sure. All I'm clear on was that she was diving 
straight down into what looked like a patch of bright green velvet, a swamp. It's amazing how you do all the things in an emergency that you've got to do without thinking about them. I had the power off and the stick back before I knew it, and almost out of the mouth of that green grave she was hell-bent on dragging us in two. Nursed her so that she wouldn't stall under the weight of G's. In coming out of the dive, I came so close to the swamp that I saw the lilies floating on it, but I was flying her then. I didn't really know I could fly an aeroplane till then. Maybe I couldn't really either. Funny thing about it, when it was all over, when I had her back up at cruising level again, I wanted to laugh. It seemed crazy, the whole business. Me going back there after a feed and hanging upside down in the roof and losing my shoe outside. I was going to look a, look a goat. I thought getting out at Cohen with only one shoe on. Funny, I didn't feel hungry anymore. I forgot all about the sandwiches. I wasn't even hungry when I got to Cohen. I only felt like a long beer. I drank a lot of beer that night. Matter of fact, I got full with some ringers. That was the first time I ever was really full. I started smoking that night, too. Matter of fact, I've never been much of an eater since that business. It's a good thing, really, because you haven't time to worry about your tucker in this game, have you? Being overweight's a nuisance to a pilot, too. Do you know how much I dropped after that business? About 40 pound in three weeks. That's 40 pound extra loading. Bush flying's a great game, isn't it? So much for the leaning down to true bush pilot size of the flying fat boy. Of course, the cause of his overeating was simply lack of confidence. Stuffing himself with food checked that awful empty feeling of insecurity that all who venture into the realm of birds experience at some time or other and continue to experience in dicey moments even when they have had their wings so long as to have acquired also something of the instincts of birds.